restless, irritable, discontented. You know, like it's really eloquently described in our literature. I didn't feel safe is really the main thing. And I learned a lot about denial and I learned a lot about fantasy. I learned a lot about let's play pretend this isn't happening. Hi, Tony. Thank you for doing this. If you want to just sort of introduce yourself, uh, please go ahead. It's always better when it comes from the person. Sure. Thanks for having me here, Mike. Uh, my name is Tony and I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict and codependent. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, my sobriety date uh, this time around is August 1st, 1998. I am a member of uh, various 12-step fellowship groups. Um, the uh, uh, most recent uh, coming around of, of August 1st, 1998 is, uh, is my sober date, but it's not the first time I found recovery. I found it probably about 13 years prior to that. And, uh, but this, uh, this date is what I call my surrender date. It's my date that I really actually gave myself completely over to the 12 step model program. Um, I struggled a long time with that, particularly around the higher power stuff, but, you know, being one where I was really completely expunged of all resources and all, I guess, manipulations, and I had no other options, I really had no other option but to turn to a higher power and the program. So that is my current sobriety date. Um, I call it my God date, if you will. And I pray uh, that that never changes. I, I don't think that it will. I don't know how much you want me to get into things um, at this stage. Um, but I am a, uh, um, a member of AA, and uh, but I'm also a recovering drug addict. I think primarily drugs was my was my thing for a long time. I did drink alcoholically, but I used the fellowship and the program of AA primarily uh, for safety reasons. Um, and, um, you know, not to sort of pit one against the other, I think they all draw on their various experiences and have fabulous things about them. But my primary fellowship is Alcoholics Anonymous. I also work in the field of addictions. I have done that for a number of years since about 2002. So I do work for an organization that models off the work of, of the 12 step model. And so that's really great. So I kind of live and breathe and, and I'm very passionate about recovery. So it's really kind of nice because I get an opportunity to like really live this life, you know, and there's no shame. Uh, there's no having to hide it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, an ability to kind of wear one face all throughout, which is really nice. I know a lot of people don't really get that opportunity. Uh, I'm very transparent with my recovery life. So my family knows about it. My, like I said, I work in it. So my, my work life knows about it. Every pretty much every aspect of my life is, is really rooted in this. So that's really, really fabulous, I think. Um, and as I'm speaking these words, I'm realizing just how lucky and grateful I've had that opportunity because a lot of the people that I work with, you know, I have a recent sponsee actually that um, struggles with that, struggles with the honesty and being uh, really transparent and accountable to his recovery and has struggled with it as with many of us. So, um, I don't know, did you want me to talk a little bit about my story and what brought me yeah, today? Yeah, I think I just want to kind of mention, it's just nice hearing you describe that. I think also for the people that will listen to this, I think one, you know, from the work, from being around you in the program and observing your commitment to it and how you live the principles of the program I, I find very admirable and and which is part of why I wanted to have this discussion with you because you do really you're just a great example of the program and so um I I, I do want you to get into the, your story a, a bit and 
But one thing I want to ask you, which we maybe would have gone into later, but since you kind of mentioned it, this idea of finding, I think you said like the safety of AA, I think I often find that interesting. And when talking to people who may consider a 12-step program of recovery, I I often have those thoughts in my head because I also found safety in AA and found wisdom there and guidance and all that stuff, which I didn't necessarily find elsewhere, not to say that it isn't elsewhere or in other programs, because I definitely learned from other programs, but yeah, maybe just if you could share your thoughts on, on that kind of balance between particularly, I think for people in early recovery, finding a group that is safe and stable, right. With, with wisdom to draw from and and maybe just how you think about those things. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, I, first of all, you know, grew up in a, what I described to you as a normal alcoholic upbringing. Um, there was a lot (laughs) that went on, particularly in my developmental years, um, particularly around trauma and not feeling safe. So not feeling safe has been a key indicator all the way through my life. Didn't really understand this for a long time. Actually, well into my recovery life, I didn't understand, you know, the need to feel safe and how important that is to the recovery process. And so I never Mm -hmm. had that, you know, I just, it was never really something I always suffered greatly with anxiety. Um, I was restless, irritable, discontented, you know, like it's really eloquently described in our literature that look like a lot of things, particularly in early developmental years. Um, It looked a lot like, you know, attention deficit disorder. It looked a lot like negative acting out. It looked a lot like, you know, I was getting into trouble being the class clown. It looked a lot like a lot of things. And, you know, really what I get today is somewhere along the line in my development, I really internalized what we call the disease of, of alcoholism. And, um, you know, and it's really cunning, it's really baffling, and it's really powerful. And that infiltrated into my psyche when I was really young. There was a lot going on, I won't get into a lot of it, but I didn't feel safe is really the main thing. And I learned a lot about denial. And I learned a lot about fantasy, I learned a lot about let's play pretend this isn't happening, you know? Um, And that's what I did. Uh, In order to feel safe as a child, I gravitated to, you know, things that in my perception gave me that ability, which was a lot to do with separating myself from people because a lot of my feelings of unsafety were coming from experiences involving people so as a kid I just thought if I just stayed alone and in my room by myself in my world of make-believe and fantasy uh, that would be the ticket and that actually really worked marvelously for a long time you know I I also understand the disease of addiction to be to be a uh, an illness of lack of connection and separation and so for me that really started very young as well because I was pushing people out. I was becoming very antisocial. Didn't really have good skills in socializing with kids. I faced a lot of rejection. There was a lot of harm that was happening to me in in my childhood. Um, And not to pit any one thing, because I really feel addiction is a complex thing. But I think what I want to articulate is I always felt inside like I just didn't fit in and I didn't connect and I didn't belong didn't feel it in my family and I didn't feel outside I didn't do well in school because I was always off in daydream world in la la land Um, so when I found substances and drinking drinking was actually my first thing uh, my first substance actually smoking was my first substance that I got addicted to but the first one that really led me into serious consequences was drinking and substances 
And, um, and that worked marvelously. Like I remember that first experience of drinking, really it being very profound. And I had what I would describe as a spiritual experience. I had a spiritual awakening, like my spirit came alive and I felt free and I felt great and I felt fabulous. And it was something that I, I remember distinctly feeling when I, that first surge of warmth and calm and, and it was, it was magical. It really was. And I remember wanting to feel that way whenever I could. And uh, so, and, and then it quickly went in that first experience went into drunkenness and then I blacked out and it was kind of ugly after that. But what happened in my brain, in my mind, was that alcoholic obsession kind of got turned on. And it never left me, never, ever, until I actually surrendered. Um, So I had a lot that went on. You know, there was the progression of the disease. I quickly found drugs and the party people and started to get into a lot of trouble. Um, Just escaping. That's what I did. I, I was escaping from myself and from reality, really, because the reality that I knew at that time was too tumultuous and there was too much going on and too much suffering and hurt. Um, And so drugs and alcohol really was my escape mechanism that really worked quite marvelously for a long time until it didn't work anymore. That started happening around the age of 23, where I had my first overdose that landed me into a treatment center. And that's where I started to understand the process of recovery, I started to get introduced to it. And that's where I found AACA. I'm from another Windsor, Ontario, originally. So um, Windsor is a small town. But you know, the good thing about Windsor is it had Detroit across the river, and it had a big city what had, had had a lot of recovery going on there. And we used to do a lot of the other fellowships because AA was was in Windsor. But fellowships like Cocaine Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, they were pretty much bigger in Detroit. I, um, now, Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, has been, it's the first fellowship of its kind and has been around for the longest. And I think there's a maturity that was there that maybe my spirit sensed uh, that wasn't really in AA, um, in CA or NA. Um, both all all of them have their particular things that are really quite wonderful but i think what my spirit was really gravitating to was the maturity you know of of the fellowship you know there's long timers there there's long timers in the other ones too but there's like uh stability and there's you know i don't know it's just you know i was going to all three and each one you know anyhow what was speaking to me at the time was rarely have we seen a person fail who has Hmm. thoroughly followed our path. So what I was doing was I was kind of going to all of them, but I wasn't really completely giving myself over to this simple program. And so what was really becoming true, even though I was, and I guess I had to go to all of them to see where I fit. And so I heard a lot of my my experience, strength, and hope in the rooms of CA and NA, but I found the stability of AA really kind of speaking to me. And so yeah. that, and so I, I just decided to make AA. And so I was a member of a group in downtown Toronto. It had a lot of cross addiction. Um, and so it worked, you know, yeah. and I'm still a member of a group that has a lot of cross addiction. So even though we try to adhere to singleness of purpose, but for me today, it's not about what I did. It's about my recovery life and recovery is the same. It doesn't matter where it, what felt it's all about, you know, using the principles of the program to, right. you know, to stay so. Yeah. 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 And, and that's another reason I really wanted to talk to you about those things. Cause you have such um, insight and experience with them before maybe getting into that. I think it's helpful to clarify as best we can. You mentioned, because I I kind of want to speak to the, in some sense, obviously people familiar with the program will know what we're talking about. For people that aren't as familiar, 
I think there's not confusion, but lack of clarity on sort of the language of the program. So you use the word, or the program uses the word, the disease, the disease of alcoholism, the family disease of alcoholism, that type of thing. And one thing I want to point out is the the language and the literature, at least the big book and the primary literature was written so long ago in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, I guess. I don't know when the last edition came out, what, but so by when when the the word disease is used, really it's implying a malady, right? Of the mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. And and so I think some people get caught up in the words, you know, oh, it's not a disease, it's a habit, or it's a this, or it's, but in some sense, what we're learning is to surrender or to let go of our obsession over trying to define things and use those as excuses not to follow the guidance, maybe, or the principles. Um, would you add, so I wanted to just talk about the sort of idea of the disease a little bit. And then the second piece you mentioned, which I think is so relevant because, you know, it could have been, those words could have come out of my mouth was just remembering that first time I ever got high or inebriated. It was, ma like you said, magical. In some sense, it was a spiritual experience because all of a sudden everything seemed to make sense and feel okay. And, and, and that's a really distinct experience, I think, for people who end up, <laughs> I guess, uh, addicted or in the life of addiction or alcoholism is, is it really does work and it is does great things for us until it doesn't. So maybe um, if you could talk about this idea of a disease and maybe how you think about it or how you see other people maybe struggle with it um, and then and then maybe also how you also see people talk about I mean you kind of did but what the substances do for us uh, until they stop working so thanks Mike uh, you know I, it's it's interesting you know I, I I think all of us really struggle with that concept of it being a disease uh right. in some way um i i refer to it as a sickness um but it is i think by definition uh and it fits for me that that it does work like a disease like it is progressive like in in any in any illness you know mm -hmm. if left untreated uh it is um it will be incurable and it can potentially be fatal. Um, it does, like any disease, affect uh, people outside of the sufferer. You know, if you think of someone who gets cancer, for example, or some sort of terminal illness, some sort of pathology, um, what happens is, is people become obsessed with you know, that individual and their care and trying to control it and trying to manage it and, um, and do all these things. And I, I, I saw it with my own mother, you know, my mother, when she was getting older, and she lost her ability to walk, everybody became obsessed with her care, and trying to fix her, you know, and I found myself in the very same situation with family members with their addiction, the, the exact same dynamics were happening uh, with me doing, all of us actually, really, but that's kind of what landed me in Al-Anon because I was doing the <laughs> same bloody thing over and over and over thinking I wasn't going to do this. And, it, and it's progressive and it's, and it's much the same trajectory in those of us that are affected by right. the disease as the person who's infected with the disease you know we all somehow fall into the same booby traps right and so you know I, that's how i kind of look at it that you know yes it may may start out for most of us as habit you know that it's like oh we take this and it, it feels great and we just want to keep doing it and it then it becomes a habit but i think we cross somewhere along the line, those of us that have addiction, you know, we cross the line somewhere along the line, 
it goes into intentional drinking or intentional using deliberate, you know, to escape, right? Um, and then, of course, it's progressive, it gets worse and worse. And then I think what really is the key indicator is when I try to stop, and then I really can't, you know, or, or if I stop at some point, and then I just find myself picking up again, like stopping and stopping, like, but when I make that solemn, you know, and I think people... I know people with the, you know, at my workplace, we use the sort of disease of diabetes. We illustrate it a lot in conjunction with, with chemical addiction because it's, it's in alignment. So you'll see people using sugar much the same way to alter how they feel. Um, they may get sickened with diabetes, but they'll continue to do it anyhow. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people I know that suffer with diabetes and they continue to do it anyhow. Now, diabetes may not cause the same kind of behavioral uh, issues that uh, alcohol and drug addiction will, but it's the elements are the same. They're, they're doing it, it's hurting them. It's probably gonna kill them, but they're doing it anyhow and they can't stop it. Or they will take, you know, di you know I have a friend who's got that. He just, I'll just take more insulin and then continue to eat. It's like, it's crazy. And that's the insanity of of what we're dealing with and um, mm. but it's it's a hard one it's a lot like because it's more along the mental health stuff and you know i know right. a lot of people that struggle with mental health issues same sort of thing like they don't they won't don't want to surrender to the fact that they have this thing you know right. and it's like you know i mean i think you know in terms of the steps like we learn that really step one you know is the one that we really have to understand and, and really take 100%, you know, all the rest of the steps, we can kind of work them, but to really understand and truly concede to my innermost self that this is what I am. Like for me, it took a long, long time and it took repeated attempts and repeated failures at doing it my way before I actually really surrendered. And that was uh, like, thank God I lived to see that because I've been around these rooms a number of years. And I know a lot of us don't, you know, a lot of us succumb to the, you know, to the illness or the disease, you know. Um, so actually on that note, Tony, let's, I, and I, maybe you can use examples from your experience to help illuminate the steps, but let's step one. I just want to read it for people. So step one is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And that, in some sense, relates to what you were saying, even with the diabetes. Um, and I guess, yeah, so let's just go with that. <laughs> I was going to read something from the 12 and 12, but maybe just starting with the steps. So we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, and that our lives had become unmanageable. So the one word in there I would hone in on is powerlessness. Um, and I think, you know, the unmanageability part is, uh, is also an important part, but it's the powerlessness one that I, I personally struggled with. Uh, I would say it in the rooms. I spent a greater part of 13 years in AA primarily. Um, and I would say, my name is Tony, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, well, that's what we do. You know, that's what we yeah. say. I mean, it's right, a right. polite thing to do in, in the rooms <laughs> as identification. But I don't know that I had actually internalized what that really meant. You know, I don't know that I actually internalized that I had a lack of power, that I was, right. in fact, powerless over you know, my substances, right, alcohol, right. Um, and to make that admission, okay, and, and, you know, I think in the Alcoholics Anonymous AA Big Book, it really describes step one really well in the first 43 pages of what powerlessness truly means. Myself, I never really sat down with a sponsor, never really read the literature, kind of used AA a lot for the fellowship, you know, it was great. I got a lot of attention. It was wonderful. But I, I didn't know really what I was dealing with in terms of the obsession of the mind and that fact that I was 
powerless over it and how this obsession of the mind would eventually get me and I would succumb to it. And then, so we talk about in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, the physical allergy that once I ingest alcohol or drug or anything that makes me feel good, that sort of I have that tendency to, to roll with, sets up this reaction in my body that I find it virtually incapable of stopping, you know? Um, and so that to me is like the powerlessness and the unmanageability. The powerlessness is more for me centered around the obsession that's really relevant in my mind that really I, you know, I, I cannot seem to control, you know, in, in some way. And, and I think in our world, we are so set up to believing that we can control things, you know, right. just with the right. power of the will and the power of the mind, you know, and of course I bring this into my recovery life and I don't know, I struggle with that, Mike, because there are some things that I've had, you know, <laughs> great <laughs> obsessions over, but I was able to control it. But I don't know, for whatever reason, where it came to this, I, you know, it was powerful. It was much, much more powerful than I was able to. So, you know, and, and for me, like the only thing that really was able to work was reaching out, you know to a power greater than myself. And that kind of looked like a lot of things, but yeah, you know, powerlessness, you know, the principle of step one that I've come to understand is honesty and surrender. And, you know, I think those are important to, to mention because like, I think all of our steps, traditions and concepts have associated principles. And those are what, you know, I think we need to study and learn. You know, and for me, like understanding and conceding to my innermost self, like having that honesty that this is what I am. And that was very hard to do, you know. Can I, I want to ask you about that point because, so from my own experience, I was very shortly after I started getting high or drinking, whatever, I was fully hooked in like basically a seven days a week nonstop until the day it all ended. But so when I entered recovery, to me, it was very clear that I, I never doubted this idea that I was, or, or, or I always knew that I was an addict, that I had a problem, but it was sort of, maybe it was just a fleeting thought or something I couldn't handle or couldn't fully embrace because it was maybe just too hard to understand. And I had no idea what to do about that fact. And maybe just, and because as you were speaking, I never really thought about it this way. So I was clear that I was an addict. Every time I tried to stop, I couldn't stop. I had various consequences as a result of my using that didn't deter me um but i but that concept of powerlessness which is so as you say fundamental and important for us to move on i don't know how that emerged for me or or like i knew i couldn't ever stop or do it on my own but I think there's a difference between a recognition of knowing you have a problem and the idea that you're powerless and and then the paradox of that admission is power in some sense right so by admitting that we're powerless and surrendering we gain power or agency or strength or something um but maybe uh do you see any difference between sort of the knowing that you're fucked up and the admission that you're powerless over it i think you know by me making the admission although i didn't use that word you know uh, when i was in yeah. that moment of surrender <laughs> what i did say was i could not do this anymore like i okay. made that yes, yes conscious yes, yes. acknowledgement that right. i understood i 
could not live like this anymore. Yes, right. And right, right. I was prepared to do whatever it took right, this time. Right. You know, okay. so I was That's in a really complete nice. yeah, yeah. state of surrender. Right. I remember I was on my knees in my apartment <laughs> upstairs, uh -huh. sobbing uncontrollably, crying out to whatever was out there. And I didn't know yeah. what it was, but I just knew I was done. I had no other options. And I, and that's when grace came into mm. me, you know, mm. and, and, you know, it just, I think by that admission, cause that was my admission yeah. of powerlessness of hopelessness, that it actually opened me up. It opened something up in me right. to right. the possibility of hope. Cause I was in that jumping off place that the big book describes that I couldn't live with it and I couldn't right. live without it. And I wanted to jump off my ninth floor balcony because mm -hmm. like I was so far backed into a corner in that moment, you know, it's that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body that is described. I was in, you know, it was like, I don't know what to do. My life is so screwed up to, to paraphrase your word yeah. completely effed, you know, yeah. Yeah, I might as well just kill myself <laughs> like that right. is all right. that I could think to do was to jump off my balcony. And I was really prepared to go through with it. But there was this little voice that this little voice inside of me that said, No, not yet. You never did what they did. You never followed right. my right. way. Right. It was right. like right. almost right. like God was speaking through my mind. And I really thought I was going nuts. Because at that time, if you could picture my life, I was so out of control. The only way that I could eat was it, at the missions, you know, in the soup kitchens in downtown Toronto. Um, if I ever ate, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, and there was a lot of people that had mental health issues that were talking to God, you know, and maybe <laughs> God was talking to them. And I thought this was happening to me. But, right. you know, the difference was like, there was like this comfort truth that it was like, yeah, you know, it's probably right. I never like, cause it kept directing me back to AA, you know, like that's what the voice kept saying. You never did the program. You never followed my way. Like it was very specific, you know, maybe your life doesn't need to be like this. Maybe you never have to feel like this ever again. All you need to do is follow my way. And it was saying it over and over. I don't know if you've ever been in that state of mind where you think you're going completely out of your mind. Yeah, yeah. But yet this is what the voice was saying to me. And I broke down and I realized, I realized it, the moment of truth hit me. It was like the blinders were removed. And yeah. all of this, like, it seemed like it was happening over such a long period of time because I was sobbing uncontrollably. But there was this moment of clarity, this moment of truth that came to me, that hit me. If I went, just went back to AA and did what they did, because the truth was there were people in AA that stayed sober, that were happily sober, you know, that were long time sober, you know. So maybe if I just did what they did, it just might work for me too, you know. And so that was my step one moment. It was actually a step one, two, and three, all nicely yeah, packaged yeah. into that moment yeah. of surrender <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I yeah. never want to go through again, <laughs> mind you. I mean, as beautiful as it was, right. and as much as it opened me up to this marvelous life that I've lived, I don't ever <laughs> want to go to that place again. Because I know what had to happen just before that to get me to that place. Right, you know? right. Um, I want to so that's I like how you said sort of the step one, two, three, all at once. Yeah. Um, I remember. I, it's so hard to describe, but I do remember actually someone who, you know, from the program who helped me so much, Alex. I remember after I checked myself into the uh, outpatient program, he, he looked at me, just said, it doesn't have to be like this anymore. And I think for me, that was. I just remember a melting in tears sort of, and it gave me a big hug. But I think that was really one of the first times I ever experienced. I don't know if it was surrender so much as like, yeah, it was probably a mixture of surrender 
and freedom. Because in that, it, that's the paradox of admitting we're powerless and surrender is that we actually gain freedom in that acknowledgement and which is very hard and something we just hold on to for dear life, I guess. Um, and then, so let's sort of take that into, because as you mentioned too, like, so we admit we're powerless, our lives are unmanageable. I think it's also maybe important to point out the unmanageability is unique to each individual. And I certainly know, <laughs> I did, and I know others do, is we compare ourselves to others to justify our own inaction, right? Or our own, oh, I'm not as bad as that person, or oh, I, I could do this differently because that person is different, whatever. So we learn to stop comparing ourselves to other and others and use self-referral as a marker of how messed up things had be, things are. And then step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, so this idea, as far as I understand it, step two, in some sense, is, is an admission that we're, this is where people get caught up in the words, that we're insane, that we're a mess, and that we, I think that's it, basically, is just like, that we're a mess, and that something other than ourselves can help us or something I often think of it as not myself will. But I also, the last thing I'll say about it is I heard Sam Harris the other day, who's a staunch atheist and anti-religion, anti-God, all this kind of talk. And he was giving a talk about mindfulness and someone actually asked him, he said, I'm in AA. This was an audience question. I'm in AA and I'm struggling with this idea of higher power because I'm an atheist or something like that. And I was shocked at Sam Harris's response because he's so anti-God and religion. He said, well, to me that, I don't know how much he actually knows about the program, but he sort of said, from what I do know of other people in the program or what I've heard, to me, this idea of a greater power is not hard to get around in some sense as an atheist because everything is a higher power he said it was so interesting he's like you know just the fact that we're all alive in this world doing what we're doing is an absolute mind-boggling thing to contemplate and so he sort of i was just i thought it would be important to add that from an atheist perspective that it's not about god in a christian or or islamic or jew like the tradition, the traditional modern religious context. It's not that. And I think it's important to clarify that. I know it was for me because I couldn't even say the word God for a few years. Um, anyway, that's my little story of, of step two. But can you continue, I guess, because you said you had all three at once, I guess. So what does yeah. yeah, what does step two mean for you and maybe anything about the sanity piece or so thanks for clarifying that, Mike, first of all, because I know a lot of people come to the program with the same thing going on. You know, yeah. uh, I did too. I, ve yeah. I, grew, I was raised Christian um, and uh, Catholic to be, mm -hmm. uh, and there was just a lot of baggage that came with that. And so, and I vehemently denied the existence of God. I started doing that when I was a little boy. Um and yeah, so I think a lot of people come to the program with the same confusion around the word. And I understand today it's, it's just a word that describes a supernatural experience. And it's hard to articulate with our human conception mm -hmm. of what that supernatural experience is we just know it works. We know it transforms <laughs> lives. We don't know how. It's just like there's something that happens. And, you know, it, 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 it's such a, like, I don't get caught up on the language. Like I read, I'm a very much a person that uses the big book. Um, it's a dated book. It was written in the thirties. Yeah. It has a lot of language that I know it ruffles a lot of feathers. Did that with yeah. me too. I don't, get so caught up in that anymore because now I understand it's about the principles it's not about the language and how the book yeah. you know I think 
the thing is, when I hit that moment of surrender, that meant I quit fighting. Yeah. I was in surrender, <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> yeah. in like, okay, what do I got to do here? I didn't right, balk right. at things. It didn't mean I wasn't afraid. It didn't mean I didn't think things and I didn't want to do things. It meant that I was, because, you know, the reality was I did anything in my disease, in my active addiction, right. especially in crack cocaine. You know, when I was on a good run, there was nothing I wouldn't do for more you know, and, you know, I just had to just tell myself in my recovery, like, are, am I willing to go to any lengths? The answer was yes. So that meant I stopped debulking. I stopped saying, yeah, but, you know, I stopped doing all of that stuff because the truth was, you know, it worked with people. Like I saw it. I saw people that were joyful, that were happy, that were free, you know, and so like, I just is, do I want what you have? And am I willing to go to any lengths to receive this? So I just want to read one thing because it really mm. helped me to understand unmanageability. Yeah, it's the, the unmanageability step one. It's on page 52. And it said, we had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems, the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy and we couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. So that to me really demonstrated what unmanageability meant, you know, like, and I still get that sometimes, you know, like all of a sudden, I'll get this visceral reaction. You know, for example, somebody will do something I don't agree with at work. And I'll get this <laughs> visceral reaction, even though like I, you know, and it's like, where does this come from? You know, or I'll get totally thoroughly annoyed, you know, a sponsee won't do what I want them to do, you know, yeah. they relapse. I'll get this visceral reaction. Like these are like, this is what I call unmanageability. Like it just comes out of nowhere. As right. much as I like will logically tell myself, I'm not going to do this anymore, but it just, and I, I just can't seem to, you know, to control it. And uh, so, you know, like, you know, understanding and going through the book with a sponsor was really, really helpful. And for me, understanding the principles and the steps, you know, and so, you know, completely getting to that place of surrender and honestly admitting to myself that this is what I was. And I think most importantly, honestly admitting that I couldn't do it alone and that I needed help was right. key, really opened me up to the power of step two. There's right. a, there's a story, they, they, they call it the jaywalker story that's in the big book. And, you know, I think it really, it really describes the insanity of the, you know, like, you know, how the person goes out and has this addiction to jaywalking and then like, you know, and it just, I think it really illustrates the insanity of the disease. I think what, what they're talking about is not so much insanity in terms of like, um, it's like why we keep doing it over and over in spite right. of the right. fact of right. saying we're not right. going to do it yeah. again, yeah. you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get caught up on like, how dare you say I'm insane? You know, like, it's like, you know, cause like, I think a lot of us want to believe that we've got it all under control. Like, I don't know about <laughs> you, but I would never let you really see me. And that right. was insanity. Like here I am. And I use this analogy of like, saying, help me with keeping you at bay and pushing you away. But here I'm saying, help me, you know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> like that's insanity here. I'm coming to you asking you for help. But then all of a sudden in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's not the help that I was asking about, you know, like I would think the help was supposed to look a certain way, you know? Yeah. And for me, I had to get right with, and I still have to, to be honest with you, Mike, because I, I like to think I know what I need, you know, and I have this arrogance about me, you know, and, and, you know, of course, like, I want to gravitate to the easier, softer ways, like, who wants to do spiritual work all the time? Like, who wants to go out and help others all the time? You know, I'm selfish and self-centered. That's the core of my 
ism. I truly believe that, you know, I, in itself will look like a lot of different things at any particular day, but at the bottom line, you know, that's, I don't want to be transparent. I don't want to, you know, do all like pick up the phone, reach out for help, like all these tools, like in my alcoholic state of mind, I don't really want to do these things. Right, 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 right. Unless I have to, to save my life, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, so step two for me is like, you know, open me up to the power of the program and the power of, you know, that there might be some hope for me, you know? Um, mm. And to me, like that is the spiritual principle is hope, you know, and that, you know, just maybe yeah. it might work for me if I continue <laughs> on with the program. You know? Right. I am, I have my big book here too, and I have that section highlighted on page 52 i want to so let's go on to maybe step three but i want to i'm going to read from 52 as well because it's on this point of um power greater than ourselves we agnostics and atheists were sticking to the idea that self-sufficiency would solve our problems when others showed us that god's sufficiency worked with them we began to feel like those who had insisted the rights would never fly <laughs> like the mm -hmm. Wright brothers. I didn't read the first part of that, but, and then my, I won't read the rest, but I have a note in the thing, reason and logic and spirituality can work together, which I think is so useful and something that the quote unquote logical, uh, no, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, rational like we think part of the disease at this point or the illness is the rational mind thinking it can solve it through its thinking mm -hmm. right which is just more or a lack of surrender and and learning that we can use reason or logic or rationality and also practice spiritual principles is so empowering in some sense but i guess part of the Part of the process is i guess learning how that can work for you i guess something like that i don't know what like how how did that start happening for you the balance between using the rational mind and the thinking mind with the spiritual principle of surrender something like that well, I think I, I've always relied. I've always thought I had a rational mind, although it was <laughs> yeah. completely irrational, but I always thought I did, you yeah. know, like I really did. Like I, you know, going back to my original statement about not being able to trust and feel safe, I went into mm. my head. That's right. where I stayed. And I always relied on my thinking, you know, and I was quite clever you know, I was quite smart in many ways. Um, you know, you don't live a life like I did as, as an addict and not get through with it without like being clever and, you know, and having to outsmart people because it's a pretty ruthless life out there. Yeah, right. And right. Uh, so there was that part of it. And, you know, I used to always think that I was just so bloody smart. In fact, I got <laughs> released from a treatment center based on that, you know, because the doctor said, you know, Tony, we're, we're discharging you because you're too smart and people like you do not get this program. So you, we're wasting your time and you're wasting ours. So we're going to let you go. And I remember being so offended. Like, what do you mean you're discharging me? Like, you're supposed to be helping me. But I understand now today, they wouldn't have been able to reach me because I right. had all the answers. Right. I knew, you know, I was always there with some sort of rebuttal and had some sort of answer, you know, I'd be sitting there arguing with my therapists. Here I'm in a treatment center, I'm completely insane. And I'm arguing with them, you know, like, yeah. you know, so I get it now, I get it, you know, instead yeah. of like asking the questions, what do I need to do, and then be obedient, and then obeying, right. and doing, right. I've, they've got 45 days, well, back then it was 45 days, um, treatment centers, um, they had a short period of time yeah. to work with something that was going to kill me. Right. And they just could not reach me. Like that's how, you know, so, but yet I, in, in my mind, I thought my mind was rational. 
yeah, you know, right, as right, long as right, I right, appeared right. cool and collected <laughs> and unemotional, right? Then right. that was a rational mind. As long as I could think it, think my right. way out of it. Um, mm. So oh, that's a great uh, example. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and honestly, Mike, to be honest with, I still am very much like, like, that's how my brain developed. Right. And so I realized, and I took a course in developmental trauma and it was very, very helpful. Um, and I realized, I don't think most of this is ever really going to go away. I just have tools to help me cope and yeah. to realize, you know, Right. maybe when I'm in that place. But I think my knee jerk reaction is always to go into my head, you know, and to try to think my way out of it, you right, know, right, right, uh, right. because that's what was safe for such a long time. So, um, uh, yeah, that's... you know, and, and, and I think that's part of what I would define as the insanity that, you know, I can't always believe that what my brain is telling me to be true you know, that I need to check my thoughts with other people. And I think that's the yeah, beauty yeah. of our fellowship and our spiritual program is mm. that, you know, we can do this with each other. And, you know, because I know for me, it really is a lifestyle of rigorous honesty and a program of action, you know. Um, and mind you, like, I want to sit here and tell you these things. Like, it's not like I want to look good, although that's what it motivated me a lot in my early recovery. Sure. But for me now, it's about being vulnerable and being honest. You know, that's what heals me. You know, I think in the beginning, maybe looking good was motivating me to do a lot of things because I wanted the accolades. But then somewhere along the line, it it, it sort of infiltrated into my soul that it was being honest, which was really going to be the key ticket for healing, right? Um, and that's not always comfortable, you know, being honest with people, talking about matters. Like I go to another program that deals a lot more with intimacy in a, in a, in a reality that I never experienced in my primary program. You know, going over to Al-Anon in SLAA, where we really talk deeply about very personal matters, you know, as a male, as someone who got used to hiding and pretending like everything's okay, you know, I didn't really want to talk about things. I still don't yeah. really want to do it, to be quite frank with you, <laughs> yeah. but I know it's good for me to do it. Right. You know, and, it, you know, so and that for me is like in step three, like faith and, you know, sort of to me, it's like like that analogy of jumping off a cliff. Right. Like just sort of jumping into something that I don't know anything about. But yet there's like this kind of knowing inside that I'm going to be taken care of, you know, that I just yeah. need to just make that jump into it mm -hmm. and know that I'm going to be taken care of, you know, that right. if I'm led to it, I will be led through it, you know? And so taking from my earliest recollection on August 1st, my surrender date, I made that admission to come back to, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I was done. Look at me today. I'm to almost 24 years sober you know, I've been through a lot in my recovery. There's been a lot of stuff that has happened over those 24 years. I'm going through stuff as we speak today, you know, but I use those same principles today that I use in that very first day that, you know, if I just follow this path that I will be taken care of. And that has not failed me. You know, it's not failed yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so today it's a little different, you know, I'm having faith in having to trust in the medical professionals, you know, in the medical community, you know, there's a lot of my brain that's wanting to get in there and sort of judge it and to distrust it. And, and, but, you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not a medical professional, you know, I'm going on Dr. Google and I'm looking at all this stuff, you know, and I just have to just trust, you know, yeah. and put my faith in their hands you know, like I did with you initially in my recovery life, right? So I kind of have that knowing, you know, that right. everything's going to be okay. 
Um, and I just got to so, keep putting one foot in front of the other, right? So Yeah, yeah. So let's, I just want to read step three. So made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understood God or him in the older literature they use, still use him. So made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understood God. And that word God is interchangeable with higher power. And in, in, I know in MA and Marijuana Anonymous, they often replace the word God with higher power in some of the literature. Um, so this idea, I think I remember also it being drilled into my mind was or at least I experienced it as it was the first time I think in my entire life or maybe in my adult life that I actually made a decision from a place of surrender or that wasn't ruled by my self-centered self-will because that ruled my life for so long and that's what caused me to use nonstop. And, and so that idea of, oh, my God, for the first time in my life, I can actually make a decision that's in service of my well-being. And if I just keep trusting this program, which is the sort of that principle of faith, maybe it's just going to be okay. You know, if I, if I just, because you mentioned it nicely too, just if I just do what they do, <laughs> you know, if I just follow the directions because a lot of us come in so defiant and and scared and self-righteous and all these things and if we can just let go and make that decision to, to turn over our self-will and surrender step three i think for me is also a lot of surrender um then we can sort of move forward and so I know in early recovery, they sort of say, you know, you go to the one step one through three rooms or you work those ones rigorously. Um, but yeah, maybe just kind of you have described it nicely, but just this idea of making a decision and turning over our self will or turning over our will. Um, I know there's a lovely prayer that I often use or just repeat to myself, just not what is it? Thy will, not mine be done. That kind of thing of just let, please get my angry self-centeredness away and let me surrender to a higher power to help me in this moment. Ha. <sighs> yeah. I'll stop talking there. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. No, that's the, uh, I think that's the, the pivotal step, you know, that's the step that you know, I launches me into the program of action, right? I mean, you know, we hear a lot in our literature, like one, two, and three are really theoretical. They're stuff that we can think about. They're not really action steps, although I've kind of, I feel that they are somewhat action steps. Uh -huh. um, you know, because making that decision to turn my, my thoughts, my, my thinking and my life, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it's a huge undertaking, right? <laughs> yeah. Like when you think yeah. about it, like, that's like, a, you know, we say in AA, you only have to change one thing. And that one thing is everything. And that is so true, <laughs> you know, and like going into like jumping into a life that I don't know anything about, you know, like, I just know how to be a drug addict, alcoholic, living in <laughs> yeah. the streets. Like I have no skill, none of that stuff. Right. And, you know, that's what I bring to AA this time around jumping into a life that I don't know anything about. Um, but I knew well enough that I was sick and tired of feeling sick and tired that my way just kept failing me over and over. And so I needed to trust in you and trust in a higher power. And so to me, the step three really came more uh, it was a more profound way when I went to an international convention in 2020, uh, 2000, I went to my big first big AA convention in Minneapolis. Mm. And just after the speaker, I remember we had this great, big, fabulous speaker there. There was about 60,000 people in this big stadium. And I remember we all got quiet and we said the Lord's prayer. And, you know, at this time, I was really like very anti-religious and anti-God. And anyhow, I don't know, something happened, though, when we prayed, 
we all got quiet. And honest to God, you could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet in this gigantic stadium. And then we prayed together and said the Lord's Prayer. Something came over me when we prayed. And I had this realization that I was home. You know, I had this feeling of safety that I had always been seeking. It finally enveloped me. I started to cry. You know, I had this feeling of like, this was home for me and I could trust it. And I could, and I heard this woman speak at that conference and something told me to go to her that this could be my sponsor. And I remember, but I was scared to do it. And, you know, like that, that whole sort of like thing of like step three, like where we kind of know that this is where, what we need to do, but we're scared to do it. Anyhow, yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of stuff going on at that time. <laughs> but I, I, I had this feeling of my higher power saying to me, like, this is home. These are your people. It's okay. To, mm -hmm. You know, like it was re mm -hmm reiterating to me what it told me on August 1st that it didn't because it took me about a year and a half to really trust it because I was like you know as much as like I was kind of all in and really willing there was a par bigger part of me that still like was finding it hard to trust you you know and to to, to really believe that this is what I needed to do you know and then, then that's really where I got my sponsor who actually became my sponsor for 20 years actually but wow. that was where this sponsor came was came when the student is ready the teachers appear like yeah. we say and yeah. that's what exactly happened and I got this woman and thankfully you know my higher power put this person in my life that because I had a lot of issues with men and trust and everything and and uh yeah. And I went on the journey of the big book and the steps and it was mo mainly the 12 steps that I did with her and, and, and it was wonderful, you know, it was scary, you know, because I had never done anything like this before, but step three was me making that commitment to, I guess, whatever it is out there that I'm putting that petition out that I'm going to just follow this way. And for me, it was like going into step four, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's what we say. It's like just making that decision to move on with the rest of the steps, really. Right, right, is, right, right. Is how I understand step three. But it's monumentous. Like when yeah. you think of it, like you're making a decision to completely change your life. Like yeah. for a fear-based alcoholic addict like me, <laughs> like that's huge. It really huge. is. Yeah, yeah. It's it is because you you see it so clearly in the people who are not quite there yet or who are hesitant, and it's so hard to. I mean, obviously, there's nothing that anyone can do for that person to help them over the hump, so to speak. I mean we can be role models, so to speak, but really people ultimately have to make that decision for themselves. And, and then once they do, as you sort of say as well, is I want to read step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And I want to just a note as, as a psychotherapist, when I, from all the literature I've read and all the different modalities, I've never still to this day come across something as profoundly helpful well i guess in in this particular way of a sort of spiritual house cleaning as the step four resentment inventory it, it is such a powerful enlightening experience um so maybe yeah let's just sort of go into the made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and as you i think that description of being enveloped by that surrender and hope and like, like that whole just okay i'm ready or i'm here and i'm gonna do this and it feels okay and safe and um because i think often we need that for step four and I remember the last thing I'll say about step four is I, the, my first time, I think I probably 
I think I did. It took me about a year and a half to get to step four because we went through everything very slowly. But I, I remember showing my sponsor and he just sort of said, what the hell is this? You know, go back to the drawing board kind of thing because mm -hmm. I only had maybe 20 to 30 entries on it. Um, and then I went back to the drawing board and surpassed sort of many. Anyway, I added many more. But it just uh, how how did what you were just describing also sort of lead into step four for you and and what was that like? Maybe we talk about step four and five together. But so you know, step three, I I make that. So how I was shown step three is yeah. I do a prayer. You know, mm -hmm. there's a in our book there's a step three prayer. So that yeah. was important. You know, when I when I did that prayer um, right away, and this is how I do it now, we mm -hmm. pray together and I get my sponsees to do it. It's very uncomfortable <laughs> for them, even for me, to get <laughs> yeah. on our knees together and pray yeah. and say yeah. the step three prayer together, but that's what we do. And then immediately we launch in, into a course of action, which is, you know, step four and the writing of, you know, in the big book, it's pretty simple. We write our grudge list, our resentments, our fears, and our harms, you know, and then we use uh, there's there's worksheets, which makes it kind of easy to do. Yeah. And it's like, what did it affect, you know, and then we and, and we find, you know, it's like, it's a process, I feel like it's really everyone should do, you know, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. I think everyone should engage in a process. It's unfortunate that we just kind of like have to get our lives so mangled up before we discover this but it's a very <laughs> yeah. beautiful uh it is and, you know yeah. it's a self-searching right it's like really sort of digging in to our character and really digging in to areas of our of our psyche that it's like you know why wouldn't we want to learn how to be better people i, I think the world sets us up though to not really focus so much on that but to focus on things that will drive materialism and you know you know competitive status and, and, status yeah. and all that it's not really about building a, a, a character right and so I didn't know anything about that I had never heard of any like who who anyhow who wants to do stuff like that it's yeah, so uncomfortable yeah, yeah. To it is it dig is, up yeah, all yeah. this yeah. stuff and <laughs> look at all like oh god you know but it's so cleansing and healing and so yeah and i mean it's it really describes it very well in the big book it's like you know we just kind of list who who we're angry at why like what they did yeah and what it affected and i think also too is like i think even in step five when we're doing step four and five uh with our sponsors we kind of look at you know because i think step five and the purpose that I understand step four is to understand what are my blocks? What are my character blocks that lead me to not being happy, joyous, and free? Because mm -hmm. I really understand our 12-step program is designed to build a spiritual experience in us that will lead us to being happy, joyous, purposefully free people right um and to give a life of purpose um and meaning right uh and and to clear away all of that stuff that was acquired through the survival right of our alcoholism and addiction so um i need to clean the slate and i think step four is a great way for me to do that and to help me understand what my higher powers purpose or intention was for me all along because like if we take it back to step three and if we look at the literature it there is a part in the in the step three 12 and 12 it says our whole problem had been the misuse of our will right yes. and it yes. was never brought into agreement with our higher powers intention for us right so that is the safe way to bring me into step four to understand what my higher powers will 
was for me. Because like to remember all that stuff that happened to me and the way that I had lived, that was all self-will, whether it was coming from other people, it was never really my higher power's will that I blamed for such a long time because I was always believing that God did this to me. God gave me this shitty life. God made this terrible stuff happen to me. Yeah, God yeah, did yeah. this because that's what I was always told growing up in my Catholic upbringing, that bad things happen to bad people. So all this terrible stuff happened because I was an inherently evil and bad person. So this was all manifest of self, right? And I didn't understand this until I actually got down to causes and conditions, which is what I, I'm asked to do in a fourth step, is to get down to causes and conditions, right? Honestly, and so the principle of step four is courage, right? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it really is a fitting principle because when you think of what we do in the fourth step where we write out all this stuff, <laughs> you know, our <laughs> resentment, our sex conduct, like all this stuff, like yeah. who does that? Like, you know, totally, like totally. ever really, like when yeah, you think yeah. about it, like, I don't know about you, you probably, you know, cause you're, you're, but most, I think most marriages, like, in most relationships, we never talk about this stuff as honestly and openly. And, you know, in our, in our preamble, it says, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very yeah, start. Like yeah. you think of those first 100 that came together to, to bring this book to us and, and all that we have in AA, what they must have gone through you know, and to be so mangled up, like they were all last gaspers, just like me, you know, they had tried every trick in the book, and then finally surrendered that this was the only thing that worked for them, this spiritual solution, you know, you know, and I think, again, like bringing it back to step one, like that's the one we have to really take 100%, because if we don't take that 100% step one, we're not going to do the rest of the steps in succession in a manner that we need to really do to heal, you know, so I understand why step one needs to be the one that has to be absolutely without a doubt 100% taken, you know, in in a way that, you know, we have to be convinced that this is truly the path we need to be. So in step three, being convinced, you know, a, the A, Bs, and Cs. A, do I understand that I'm alcoholic and cannot manage this on my own? That probably B, that no human power will be able to do this for me. And C, that God can and will if he has sought. That's the part that opens me up to the power of step four. And really to write it out in a way that, like I need to be like diligent and get it all out there and not worried about, oh my God, I have to share this with my sponsor, but to write it as though nobody's ever going to see this. Right. And to be honest and fearless and searching because those are the watch words for step four, yeah. fearless and searching moral, like, and, and, and that's the part, like, you know, I think a lot of people stumble on is like, write out the stuff that I have perceived as being right or wrong or good or bad, you know, right. in my life. Right. And so I need to really take this step with a lot of fearlessness, you know, because I don't know what that is. Like, I don't yeah, know yeah. what that is until I actually <laughs> share that with a sponsor right. and, 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 and admit it to a higher power. Right? right. Cause I don't know, like a lot of the stuff that I've internalized as being right or wrong is not necessarily true, you know? Mm. Um, so, and going into step five, you know, the principle of being integrity, you know, like sitting down with the sponsor and really sharing and bearing my soul with someone, with another human being and admitting, I think is yeah. most importantly. Yeah. So will thing. you just, yeah, read step okay want to yeah, read step five. yeah yeah uh okay yeah. step five admitted to god to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs mm -hmm. so yeah. you know and i think a lot of us go into step five thinking like we need to tell the story and i think that's important to share our story with our sponsor mm -hmm. and to to 
talk about all this stuff and you know it, it, but I think the purpose again of the fifth step and the fourth step is to really hone in what are my wrongs here like where have I gone wrong yeah you know what are my character defects like that's what we're trying to pluck out in all this yeah where have I been selfish where have I been self-seeking where have I been dishonest where have I been afraid? You know, these are the things that I really have to share openly and honestly. Because like, what am I asked to do? Admit these things to myself, to you and to God, you know, what, you know, like, and that's the, that's the real fundamentally hard part, because I don't want to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, as an addict, as, as a self-centered alcoholic, you know, I'm, I want to believe that what I did was in reaction to, yeah. you know, or there's some I, sort of excuse. For yeah, there's it, some or sort some of justification. Excuse. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people stumble on this when like, serious abuse happens to them in their childhoods, you know, sexual abuse, trauma, you know, yes, we may not have played a part in that. But what is my part today? How am I co-creating a lot of what I learned, you right. know, was what I had to look at, you know, as a, being a survivor of a lot of terrible things that should never have happened to a child. But I had to look at the stuff from a different angle, you know, as an adult, you know, and, and being a gay man, and being a person that led a life of, of, of prom promiscuity, and it's all kinds of stuff, dishon it's just all forms of dishonesty. Yeah. You know, I have, I'm asked to look at this from an entirely different angle. You know, where is my responsibility here? Yes, I may not have had a responsibility as a child for yeah. well, what, a, what was done to me or how I had to survive, but carry that forward as an adult. You know, my self-destruction, you know, for example, what have I been doing? You know, and I think it's really important for me to understand, you know, my wrongs, you know, and, and I think that's where a lot of times we don't really have clarity and we need the help of a spiritual advisor yeah. or someone yeah. who's yeah. more experienced. Because totally. left to my own devices, I'm going to want to rationalize. I'm an <laughs> addict. That's what yeah. I do. I rationalize, you know, I justify, I minimize, you know, that's what I do, you know? Yeah. So I need somebody who's going to have an objective point of view and say, sure, yes, it was not your fault, Tony. And I am so sorry that these things happened to you, but we're going to start to build a new life here, yeah. you know, and bring this forward, you know? And because this is about transformation, right? But I need to first understand and be clear, you know? And I need someone object you know like that has a different objective that has walked this journey that's walked yeah. this path that can see me in a different light because as an addict i see myself as this like monster you know that's not yet quite healed and i think this is the part of the process that opens me up to the healing yeah yeah you know it, step yeah. four and five yeah. there's such yeah. like i think a lot of people are like oh my god like it's a really monumentous undertaking for a lot of us to do because most of us never ever have done anything like this yeah. but i think like the whole process of four to nine has to be done in my experience very quickly you know because like you open it up you know you gotta start you know you gotta like you know four five six seven eight nine that's all has to be done you know and and i think very quickly yeah actually I I'm, yeah, I'm glad you sort of said that because I also want to make sure. How are you doing for time? It's already I'm two thirty. Yeah, so I'm okay, I, I I'm in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going on. I can't do anything. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, if you want to I just thinking more. also like this is uh, this might have to become a four part series. Uh, but anyhow, that's okay. It's nice to so. I I remember my. Sponsor, I guess one of my perhaps defects or one of my shortcomings was always like, we're not moving through this fast enough. 
got to go faster because I was always like, you know, look at that person. They came in the door after me and they're already at step whatever and I'm still on step whatever. Um, and he just was very patient and sort of, you know, just this is your journey, not anyone else's, like slow down. And so when I was ready for step four, whenever we got to it, it certainly was incredibly healing and scary and uncomfortable, all the things you kind of described. Um, I guess I just kind of think, I wonder in your experience, and this is sort of my experience, I guess, and sort of how I was taught is, it depends on the person, of course, but in order to thoroughly do a step four and to perhaps be ready to do that fearless searching moral inventory we need a little bit of recovery under our belts maybe i don't know like anyway that was my experience and when we have a bit of recovery perhaps we do it more thoroughly I don't really know I guess I guess I just wonder like how you've seen people get to step four and how it really does you you mentioned how it's transformative but there is something magical and spiritual and for me it was a spiritual experience in and of itself to share that with someone who I've told I told things I never told anybody and still my sponsor is the only person who's I've told any a lot of those things too so not even my therapist probably and so anyway I'm just thinking out loud just the sort of getting people there and and having it be very thorough and sincere and I know there's differing opinions on on that but anyway that's my thought yeah I think there's you know, I've done several four steps over my recovery life, probably, I would say probably close to 10. My most recent last year in the pandemic, um, when it started, my, my defects were spawning left, right and center. I'll tell you, like when, you know, this thing first hit, um, I thank God I had the program number one and I had some tools, but I had, I had to go back to basics. I really did in the beginning because everything got jolted, you know, when we were forced into isolation and forced into, you know, uh, like all the things that we had to do, my fears got triggered big time, my insecurities. And I didn't realize how much of this stuff was still anyhow I I think there's no as long as we're doing it it's okay you know because I think with trust and the more I feel safe in the rooms the more honest I can be with myself and the more that that has revealed itself to me so my last inventory that I did because I just I'm recently going through another set of the steps um, in another program that I'm in with another. Tony, sponsor. can I, I just want to ask you quickly about that. When you have redone the inventory, do you include the past stuff if it's still present or is it mostly new stuff that you are adding? So this to one it? was new material. It was okay. this, yeah. this one was on, I was going to share that it was on the seven deadly sins. So I'd always done inventories out of the a big book or the Alan yeah. has to recovery because yeah. I'm right. like okay but this one my actual my sponsor because he was in a member he he was also a member of an o- overeaters anonymous and they had a uh format that was taken from the seven deadly sins and it had a 170 questions that wow. were all tailored to pride lust gluttony sloth um, wow. wrath, wow. you know, the seven wow. deadly sins. Sure, and I sure, had never sure. done an inventory on the seven deadly sins. Yeah, which, yeah, me you know, we all have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you, Mike, <laughs> this was probably one of the best inventories I ever did. One of the most revealing, right. focused heavily on the sexual component, which I really needed for me this time around, 
because I feel like my my sex inventory from my original four steps, like I had normalized a lot of stuff that I didn't feel was a problem. So I never really honestly looked at my relationship stuff. I never really honestly looked at my, my sexual being because, you know, well, in AA, we don't really do that. It's about our drinking. Yeah. Or in yeah. NA, it's about our drug. And so, or maybe some things associated with it, but I never really honed in on it the way that I did because there was a large portion that was focused on the lust aspect. And I feel like for me, it was what was necessary and needed this time around because I hadn't really, I was very superficial. And that's the word that I would describe. Um, you know, I think largely because I had normalized so much of my experience of being gay, like there's no problem here. That's what gay men do. That's how we behave, you know? Like I never really questioned what I had learned, right? Okay. As that maybe, maybe this just wasn't God's intention for you all along, Tony. Maybe you just kind of bought in to what you had learned on the streets. And, you know, and that was a hard thing to succumb to, you know, that maybe I just didn't know what I didn't know. That's an al slogan, right? <laughs> but, you know, maybe I had just bought into all of this as, you know, a bill of goods that was normalized. Never really questioned was it God's will for me? You know, like I know I'm sort of going ahead of myself in the 11th step, okay, but, yeah. you know, so that was kind of what led me into this all over again, that I really started to ask myself some really soul searching questions here around, is it really God's will for me? Right. Um, anyhow, and it was the timing was perfect. The pandemic happened. I had a new sponsor. I thought this would be a great time for my sponsor to get to know me because this is a great way for our sponsors to really get to know us is by yeah. doing a fourth and a fifth. And I used another piece of literature as well uh, in, in complement with this guide, this four-step guide. Um, and it was exactly what I needed. And it was like, for me, it was like all brand new again, because to be quite frank with you, Mike, you know, I had done a lot of four steps over the years, but it was kind of the same material. So mm -hmm. it was the kind of the same stuff that was being reg regurgitated. So this was like, it was all brand new again. So it was like, I was almost like a brand newcomer all over again. And quite frankly, you know, I was really trying to treat myself like a newcomer in the pandemic, making outreach calls, like doing all these things that I actually hadn't had to do in a very long time. Because like, I was a person that was kind of known in the community. I didn't have to actually make outreach calls in years. Like, I don't remember having to do that in a long time. Like people call me. So like my time is spent pretty busily taking calls, you know, taking calls from newcomers, but I actually haven't had to be the one to make the outreach calls. And that was actually really good for my, just for my ego and my recovery and yeah, so uh, yeah, this whole pandemic was like, uh, it was really revealing because it made me like be a newcomer again, you know, which was really good yeah. for me because I, I wasn't a newcomer since like I was a newcomer, right? You know, <laughs> like that was kind of like the difference this time around was, you know, I wasn't like saying, oh yeah, like, cause I had been in AA several times before that. Like I had to tell myself, I didn't know anything here. You yeah. know, and I had to reach out, right? So, um, I yeah. love that. Yeah, I, I, I'm having thoughts that I would enjoy, almost benefit from, just going through the motions again as a newcomer or as a, you know, as a, for the first time, so to speak. And I'm really interested in this uh, seven sin, seven deadly sins inventory thing. I want you to get that from you <laughs> afterwards so I can have a sure. look. Be happy to share. So okay. I joined another yeah. fellowship, right? Which was SLAA and SAA. And so for me, it was like, this is all perfect. Like I can be all brand new. Yeah. 
and not be the old timer AA person that <laughs> right, I had been. Right, right, right. I'm brand new. I'm in a brand new program, brand new fellowship. It's like, it was all perfect. It was all in perfect alignment. And it was very humbling, you know? Cause like, yeah. isn't this what the steps are teaching me to do is, is be humble and mm -hmm. to rely on God. You know, just like it wasn't it self-sufficiency failed us, you know, self-reliance, you know, like that's my thing, right? I always think I, I can figure this out. I don't have to turn to a higher power if I can right, right, figure right. it out. Like, why yeah. would I, right? Isn't that what the world teaches us to do? Like, just be smart, you know, figure it out, you know? <laughs> would you ever go to your boss and say, <laughs> I don't know, you know, like, I mean, in ways like the world sort of sets us up to not like do this stuff right? yes, in, yes, yes. in many ways. And I think that's so unfortunate, you know, um, anyhow, but yeah, like, so all of it was really in perfect alignment with the pandemic and, you know, for me to be new again and, and to, really lean into the program and to, to my higher power, you know, um, what else could I do? You know, it's like when it talks about in the 12 and 12 about like, could these AA stay sober under the misery and monotony of war? Like that just like spoke volumes to me when we were going, like when we had all of this taken away from us, thank God we had zoom. Thank yeah. God we had an ability to connect. I don't think those AAs when they were out to war had that ability, you know, but they stayed sober and what, how they stayed sober was they relied on their higher power. Right. And so that's, that's what just kept speaking to me is like, just lean into this, lean into it, Tony, breathe into it. You know, I had mm -hmm. to meditate. I had to do all the, all that stuff that I was really kind of taken for granted all along, you know? Uh, just run into meetings, you know, I couldn't just run to meetings anymore. Well, now, I, yeah, we can like now with the zoom and everything, right, like, right. we can go to meetings 24 hours a day now if we wanted to, but initially we couldn't, you know, and so. Um, hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's so nice to just hear the, I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking of um, a book, a Zen book, um, Zen mind, beginner's mind, it's called, mm -hmm. and sort of the whole principle of Zen in that context, or just of is beginning again, and sort of this idea of of remaining teachable. Yeah, and yeah, just yeah. that we don't have the answers, and and yeah. that even if we think we have the answers or have had them in the past, and that they've served us, that doesn't mean that we've crossed the finish line, in which case we no longer need to be humble and willing and open to answers coming, or that we don't need to seek answers or clarity, right, or guidance. Uh, and so it was just so nice to hear you kind of describing that. Um, there's also a saying in, in Buddhism, something like, if you see the Buddha, kill it, or if you think you're the Bo Buddha, kill it kind of thing it's like if you think you have the answers then that's a problem because you don't or or it's the attachment to thinking you have the answers that's going to steer you in the wrong direction or perhaps keep you closed off from being open to what might arise um, out of a sort of humble beginner's mind idea mm -hmm. and that um I think I'm trying to, or I'm, there's a bit of that going on for me right now, I think, of, I don't know if it's, I think what it is more, and maybe we can next time, because I, I got to get to my family duties soon, yeah. but, but moving into step six and seven, is that continual willingness and openness to acknowledge our shortcomings or our problems that we uncover in step four and five and not, it, it, not that it's just a one-time experience, which I just love, which I, so, which I 
also greatly admire about you is how you embody these practices as a way of life. And so you find them and you continue to do them. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm sort of trying to, I'm trying to, or I've been experimenting with using sort of psychotherapeutic, I don't know, practices on some of the things that I'm suffering with or get caught up with, you know, that might be on a inventory and seeing, so for example, um, I'm not good at managing, I'm not good at tracking finances, which I guess would be managing them. And I have, I'm in a position where I could work more if I really wanted to, but to get more work takes a bit of effort. <laughs> That's hard for me, like sort of the this administrative work that I need to do to get more clients because they're all waiting for me. You know, all I have to do is just go through these lists and contact yeah. people and whatever. They're just waiting for you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, like, he, you know, yeah. not me personally, but they're waiting for somebody to call them. Well, yeah, but yeah, they're waiting yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. And I, it, but that's hard and uncomfortable for me, you know, because then I have to feel inadequate and I have to feel, I have to accept that this is difficult and it shouldn't just be handed to me and that I struggle with these things. And so to me, it's sort of, pulls on, a, I don't have resentment, but I have self-loathing, you know, sort of self-criticism or a sense of inadequacy, all that kind of stuff, which I'm, I'm really trying to draw on the skills I learned in the program and what the program teaches us and, and apply them to my modern struggles or my present day struggles. Uh, and that's been interesting. And I I think I'm, I've only recently really allowed myself to see that and to, and to take action, like to do something about it instead of stewing in my fear, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so maybe, um, maybe you could give us a little intro into step six and seven and maybe you know, I know you're busy and, and you got things going on, but if we can continue from like, we'll give a little intro to it. And then next time we'll, we'll continue from there. Sure. Yeah, no, it sounds great. Yeah. Uh, step six and seven, uh, uh, you know, those are, I mean, I think this whole program is about change, but that's really, I feel like where that happens, although I wasn't really clear on it. I think initially when I first, well, the first few times of going through the steps, I was so uh -huh. focused on four and five and, and eight, and nine. Oh my right. God. Yeah, I yeah. dreaded <laughs> eight, nine. Yeah. Like I was so consumed with fear, you know, and I've heard it said a lot. They, they refer to step six and seven as the forgotten steps. Cause even in, in the AA big book, they're just two little short little paragraphs um i use a book called drop the rock that's, i remember uh, you yeah you told me about that book yeah. a while back and it's yeah. a great book it uh is, yeah. it really is so good uh, i use it with my sponsees now when we're when they've done step five uh -huh. uh, we actually read drop the rock together because i think it brings clarity into a what are what our shortcomings and defects are and, you know, shortcomings is, you know, I'll describe it as what am I not doing that I need to be doing? And the defects are what am I doing that's no longer serving me, right? right. That I need right. to stop doing, right? So they're, they work interchangeably because if I think about it, I will kind of do them both together. Like, what am I not doing that I need to be doing? And what am I, and what am I doing that I need to stop doing? Yeah, right. Yeah. So they're, you know, and I, they're kind of both together. And I think for good reason, and now I kind of can clear more understand it better. But in, initially I was totally clueless over all this stuff. I had no idea um, what this even meant, the language, like it was just a bunch of blah, blah, blah to me and driven by fear. Like I was just so afraid. Um, 
all the time. And uh, so now like, you know, again, like for me, like self-reliance is a big one, you know, again, lack of trust. What am I, why am I not trusting? Mm -hmm. You know, why am I not trusting this beautiful higher power that has led me to these beautiful people like yourself and so many, like, why do I still have resistance? You know, why do <laughs> yeah. I still think my mind is telling me things to be true? Like, why am I so afraid to change? You know, I work in this beautiful environment and I have this wonderful boss that only really sees, I mean, I don't know what she sees. I never really ask her, but I know she sees the very best in me and wants me to succeed. But yet for some reason, I think it's not true. Like, you know, and so all this stuff, right? And uh, so I really need to like hone in and again, like trusting in my higher powers will for me, right? And the power to carry that out, you know, like that's the deal here. And you know, like, you're not alone, Mike, you know, when you <laughs> share that stuff about, you know, not feeling deserving or worthy, yeah. or, yeah. you know, all that stuff, I think that we yeah. all carry inside that don't really disclose because the world sets us up to believe in we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about our warts and all but isn't that where we're really connected with each other is when we really get vulnerable with one another and talk about our fears, you know, like what we've done with our sponsors. And we, we get this like awareness of our, like it talks about in our fifth step literature, that this is the beginning of the end of the isolation where we right. suddenly start to feel the nearness of our creator. That, yeah. That's so true. Like when I share a fifth step, when I yeah. really get honest with another person, I really feel like this, god stuff happening around me like i really feel this connection that i never felt before you know it's hard to describe that's why they use the word is, god yeah. but right you right, know right. so why wouldn't i trust this why wouldn't i trust like you know that god leads me to this program because i think i just need to go to treatment you know so i'm and then <laughs> treatment leads me to aa <laughs> and, you know like and this is always a recurring theme i think i need to go to treatment but treatment leads me to aa like you know right so yeah uh, and i think we need both of them and that there's not one over the other but right i think you know like just to trust in a higher power right so um so yeah the, so like yeah the drop the rock book i find is really a really good piece of literature that's published by Hazelton that I think really works in tandem with what we're trying to do in step six and seven, you know? So, and I think if there's anybody um, that's kind of in their journey, please, please use that book, you know, cause I think it really makes it very clear and palatable, you know? About awesome. So I, I, yeah, on that note, I'm going to pull mine out for next time and yeah. have a, a few few uh pointers from there uh to discuss but i just it's amazing how the time flies and um yeah so just so anybody listening we will continue from step six next time on our journey through the program uh but tony i uh, just thank you uh one for being here and giving me your time and wisdom and energy and too for just also helping me through the program uh, we mostly sort of covered some out Al our Al-Anon stuff in our private time but just you're a gift you know to the program and and to the people in it so thank you for that as well and if you sort of have any anything else you want to say before we take a pause till next time uh please do yeah well, I just want to end by saying it really does work both ways. You know, we all need each other. And, uh, you know, probably, you know, we, we say, you know, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. But I think it's more important to be a sponsor and to, and to you know, work with others. Because, like, I learned so much by, and it, it, it's an accountability thing, too. Like, mm -hmm. it, it really... Mm -hmm you know, it's an accountability thing. So yeah, so I'm just really grateful to have had the opportunity 
to share a little bit of my experience, strength and hope about something that I'm so, that saved my life, you know, like I'm so passionate about it. Why wouldn't I? It saved my life, you know? And um, yeah, I look forward to part two. Of, yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> and then three and four. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm happy to do yeah. it. Okay, good. Really. Good, you know, good, we're good, in a pandemic, good. so really yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not much else to do except, yeah. But anyway, you know, thanks, thanks again for allowing me the opportunity to be of service. Okay, and, cool. Yeah.